on judgment that was coming on the Edomites. That's how we got um, chasing this rabbit on Herod the Edomite. Brooke Neal asked me a question about Herod and how we knew he was an uh, Edomite and how that kind of fit into the story. So today we're going to chase this rabbit all the way to its end and we're going to look exclusively at the dynasty of Herod and kind of how he comes on the scene during the intertestamental period. How many years were there between the Old and New Testament? 400, good. We call that the intertestamental period, and Herod has his rise during that time. So let's start on these notes, and if this is boring, blame Brooke Neal, not me. Um, I'm just trying to answer a question. So here we go. This history is taken from Bruce Gore's work found in his book called The Historical Context of the Bible. It's a really good book. He covers a whole lot of stuff. It's an expensive book, but it's worth it, so you should get it. This is a collection of my own research, heavenly influenced by his, as well as an extended article from the Blue Letter Bible app and the works of Flavius Josephus, who was a Jewish historian who wrote 1st, um, 2nd century, right around that type of the turn. Okay, we good? All right. People estimate that Herod the Great lived from 74 B.C. to 4 B.C. Remember, the numbers are working down. We'll talk more about when Jesus was born in just a minute. Herod was born to Antipater the Idumean. His mother was Nabadian. And you might remember a couple weeks ago in your Obadiah notes, I stated that the Nabadians came in and took over the Edomites about the mid-500 B.C. Okay, let me write that down and make sure you can get it. The Nabadians took over the Edomites about mid-500 B.C., specifically 543, I think was the number. So do with that what you want. And from that time, the Edomites, who were a people, kind of got mingled in. They were a known prominent people. Then from that point, they were kind of mingled into a smaller one. That's kind of when the term Edomite starts to fade, and they start to call them Idumeans. So Idumea, Edom, that whole deal. If... If you want this in map form, I'll give it to you in this way. All right, this is the Mediterranean Sea. Edom would have been down here. Jerusalem would have been right here. And Nabadia would have been over there. Does that help? You're also thrilled and intrigued by that work. I know you are. I can just sense it in my bones. Okay, so Herod was not a Jew, though he was from Esau, the brother of Jacob. And all of this, if you haven't been here, has been a Jacob versus Esau play that plays all throughout the scriptures. They were always kind of at war with one another. Did God tell the Israelites that they could demolish Edom, yes or no? No. What did he tell them? They had to be good to him, right? Why? Because he is your... Brother. Very good, Miss Karen. All right. I like it. So he's not a true Jew, even though he was from Esau, the brother of Jacob. All of this is attested by the historian Flavius Josephus in his History of the Jews. Uh, he wrote the Jewish Wars. He wrote History of the Jews, the Antiquities. Just go search up Josephus if you want to, and you can read about all of his stuff. Well, essentially what Josephus was, was a Jew that became a de facto traitor to Rome, and he didn't believe in the Messiah. So he gives an unbiased from the Christian perspective view of the history of the Jews. I didn't mean for that to rhyme, but it did. Okay, Nabadia was the people who conquered Edom in the mid-500 B.C.s. Antipater was an official who served under John Hycranus II, who was a Hasmonean ruler. Um, now, if you're not familiar with that name, the Hasmoneans were friends of the Jews. Remember in the Catholic Bible they have the Apocrypha, they have 1st and 2nd Maccabees. Tell me about the Maccabees. What did the Maccabees do? Anybody? See how good we are at history in this class. Somebody tell me about the Maccabees. Judas Maccabeus, if you remember on Friends, they had the one with the holiday armadillo and that whole deal. So that should help some of y'all out. What did the Maccabees do? I'm not going anywhere until somebody guesses. Somebody's at least going to guess and be wrong so we can make fun of you. Can you Google? No. The Maccabees. What did the Maccabees do? Remember there was a famous Greek ruler who came in and took over the Jewish temple as it stood. And the Maccabees, led by Judas Maccabeus, were the ones who came and won the temple back. 
Remember that? So that's in the book of Maccabees, which is in the intertestamental period, which is in the Apocrypha. Do like this if you're with me. Does anybody know the name of that ruler? Who was that ruler? Antiochus Epiphanes IV. Very good. So that can be found in the book of Daniel as well, but we'll leave that neither here nor there. So whenever the Maccabees uh, went back to the temple, there were some people who were friends of the Jews that they left in charge, and they were called the Hasmoneans. So these Hasmoneans... The dynasty came into power in Judea around 140 B.C., which would have been about the time the Maccabees came and did all that. Are y'all bored yet? Yeah. Okay. All right, I mean, are we okay? Because just, I mean, just kind of think with me the history, because this is all fixing to play into the Bible. And I know, but whatever. I don't know why I did this. I just did. So get over it and fire me later. Okay. Uh, I didn't figure. I figured y'all want Justin to teach this class after he taught last week instead of me. So if that's fine, just put that back in play. Okay, 140 BC after the revolt of the Maccabees and remained in power until roughly 37 BC when the Romans took over, uh, involving a man named Pompey, and that's probably familiar to you as well. Bruce Gore states that toward the end of his power, Antipater was appointed over Judea by Rome and set his son Herod in charge of Galilee. So that would be Herod the Great over the region of Galilee, which wasn't considered much, so he just gave it to his son. This was roughly in the year 47 B.C. Antipater was assassinated just a few years later. All right, let's keep going. All of this is in the middle of Roman chaos as Julius Caesar was killed in 44 B.C., leading to the Battle of Philippi when Octavian, who is Caesar Augustus, and Mark Antony defeated Brutus. So you had Brutus kill Julius Caesar, then Octavian and Mark Antony go and defeat Brutus. Herod, who was now ruling Judea, waited to see who won before declaring allegiance. Typical politician move. So he learned politics early on in his days, just waiting to see who won. And Octavian and Mark Antony won. Around the year 40 B.C., a man named Antigonus, who was Hasmonean, decided he didn't like the Roman presence, which included Herod's rule. You've got to think about this too, guys. Turn in your Bibles right quick to Matthew chapter 1. Let me just make sure you get this, get this noted because this is so important to the biblical story. Matthew chapter 1, the way things worked, who did the kings come from in Judah? Which... In, in the southern tribe Judah, which lineage? We've been going through Genesis 49. Y'all better get this right. Who did the kings come from in Judah? Which, which son? Which tribe? The kings came from which tribe? Okay, good. So the kings come from Judah. Remember, who did the Levites come from? Uh, sorry, who did the priests come from? Gave it away. The priests come from, uh, from the Levitical tribe. This is the way this should work. You descend from here, you descend from here. Look at Matthew chapter 1, and let me show you something. Now, remember, you've got the rule of David, and then it splits, and you've still got this structure, though. The kings are coming from Judah, and the priests are coming from Levi. Matthew chapter 1, and look with me down in verse... Um, okay, look at verse 11. Josiah begot Jeconiah and his brothers about the time they were carried away to Babylon. So a man named Jeconiah really is the final tipping point for the Babylonian exile. The book of Ezekiel, uh, the book of Daniel, those type of books when they get sent off to Babylon. So at Jeconiah, when they wind up returning, how many years were they in exile? Seventy. So eventually they come back, they rebuild the city, and they rebuild the temple... But what's different now, that's a temple, by the way, if anybody was wondering. Uh, whatever, put a cross at the top of it just for fun. Uh, he had not on the cross yet, no big deal. What was different about when they returned from the exile? What happened? Okay, the temple was destroyed, but they returned and rebuilt it. But what did they not have that they used to have as a power? Okay, so they don't have kings. Whose rule are they under? Not under the judges. That was a long time ago. Whose rule are they under? 
Okay, good. You're thinking right. They're under these world empires that were appointed in Daniel chapter 2. Daniel saw the empires that would guide the covenant people until the Messiah's kingdom came. So, who did it start with? Babylon, then Medo-Persia, then Greece, Antiochus Epiphanes in that time, the time of the Maccabees, and then who was the next kingdom? Rome. So, the purpose of those worldly empires were to get the covenant people all along until the Messiah came and set up His kingdom. We good? But here was the difference. What happened was, instead of things running like they did pre-exile, whenever they come back into the land and rebuild it, then whoever's over them, specifically when Rome took over, Rome starts appointing the kings, and also Rome starts appointing the priests. So the whole system is corrupted by the time Jesus comes on the scene. Did that help anybody else? Say that again. Okay, so the Pharisees did not like Herod either, okay? So they're a different sect. As bad as we think about the Pharisees, let's ask a question. Do you ever see the Pharisees or Sadducees in the Old Testament, yes or no? When do they come on the scene? They're there in the New Testament, so they showed up during the intertestamental period. The Pharisees were technically pretty strict about things. They believed the resurrection of the dead. They believed in afterlife. They believed they were something post this world. But the Pharisees also were opposed to the Herods, okay? Notice, did the Jewish people ever go to Herod and say, free us from Rome? Never did that. Is that what they wanted from Jesus? That's exactly what they wanted. Why? They knew that Herod was in cahoots with Rome, that he had appointed them. The Pharisees were their own separate sect. Now, they got plenty of their stuff wrong too. They were legalists, but they were also opposed to Herod and the way that things were working in that deal. So if you think about it, You've got Rome and this Herod issue that's going on because they've appointed them. Also, Rome's appointing the priesthood. Then you've got the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and then you've got the Christians. I mean, you've got these three different sects of things that are running in the scheme of the New Testament, and they're all opposed to each other. They don't like them. Well, the Pharisees for a little bit depended on Rome and on the Herods, but eventually they get into it, and everybody's against the Christians except for Rome, who's backing them. So, did y'all get that? Let me write that out. Let's just think about this. This is important. Make sure you get it. Okay. Do the Pharisees like the Romans? Yes or no? No, but, but do they need them? They need them but need them. Remember what they said? We have no king but... Okay, yeah. So the Pharisees don't like the Romans, but they've got to have them. Now, the Jewish leaders, let's, let's call it including the Pharisees, did the Jewish um, leaders like the Christians? Yes or no? No. Everybody with me? Did the Romans like the Christians? Yes or no? But did they protect them? Yes. Who are the ones that always, whenever the Jews persecute the Christians, who always comes to their defense? Why? Because that's the way God set it up. The purpose of those Gentile nations that were over them were to coddle, more or less, or to protect the covenant people until the time of the Messiah when He came. Has everybody got it? Yeah. Herod fits smack dab in the middle of every bit of that. And all of that changes after the exile in Jeconiah and Matthew chapter 1 there. Okay, beneficial or no? Yeah. I know it's boring, but if you really want to understand what's going on in the New Testament... Then we've got to spend just a little bit of time studying the history. All right, let's go back to the notes. Um, and let's look at the middle of the page around the year 40 B.C. A man named Antigonus, who was Hasmonean, friends of the Jews, decided he didn't like the Roman presence, included Herod's rule, so he went to the neighboring Parthians, who didn't like Rome being close to invading their territory, and they drove Herod out. So Herod gets essentially kicked out by the Hasmoneans and the Parthians, and he flees to Rome. Eventually, he gets a hearing before the Senate to be reinstated. In the year 39 B.C., the Senate 
decides to make Herod the king of the Jews. So he put him over the realm of Judea. You're wondering, Matthew 2, Herod's king of the Jews, how? Roman Senate appointed him. That's what I'm saying. All of these people are in cahoots. This is obviously important to the biblical story in Matthew 2. Not only was the Herod dynasty involved with Jesus, but also responsible for beheading John the Baptist and encountering Paul on trial at the end of the book of Acts. More on this later. In 37 BC, Herod reconquers Jerusalem away from the Parthians with the help of Mark Antony. And his relationship with Mark Antony is extremely important, so note that down. And I spelled Mark wrong there. Uh, I'm pretty sure it should be M-A-R-C. Nonetheless, keep going. The Jewish people understood Herod's connection to Rome, which is why they didn't look to him or his family to get them out from under Roman rule. They did look to Jesus for this in John 6. Remember Jesus feeds the 5,000? And it says in John 6, they came to Jesus, tried to take him by force to make him king. And what did Jesus do? He fled away because that wasn't the type of king he was. He wasn't going to give them a physical kingdom to go and fight with sword and battle to defeat the Romans. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight. Well, what was his, is his kingdom in the world? Yes, but it's not ran like kingdoms um, all over the rest of the world. He conquers by the sword of the gospel, the sword of piercing going out. Isaiah chapter 2 says, there, in the time of the new covenant, they would beat their swords into plowshares. Everybody got that? You know what that means? Instead of fighting physically, they beat them into plowshares for harvesting, preaching the gospel, and they came in. Yes, ma'am, it does. I think it's Isaiah chapter 11. Okay. Very last paragraph. It says, I also think getting out from under Roman rule was the reason for wanting Barabbas who was a zealot per John 18. Zealots were the ones who, who wanted to go to war against the Romans all the time. They constantly wanted to go against war against the Romans, and that's what the Jews wanted from Jesus. Well, remember, you've got Barabbas and you've got Jesus, and they, they say, pick one. Well, Bar means son of, Abba means father. You've got a worldly son of the father who was wanting to physically fight the Romans, and you've got the heavenly son of the father, Jesus, and they wanted the worldly son of the father. So they chose Barabbas instead of. Jesus, the true Son of God, who would be the one who would free them from everything. Make sense? All right. Next page. I know y'all wanted a history lesson this morning. I'm trying to put people to sleep today, so stay with me. One of Herod's biggest issues was whether or not the Jews liked him. And if you'll remember, remember how Pontius Pilate got blackmailed when Jesus was on trial? Pilate said, I find no fault in the man. So he didn't have any reason to kill Jesus. The problem was Pilate's predecessor had been removed because the Jewish leaders cried on him to Rome. So they kept calling Rome and said, hey, we don't like this guy causing issues. So they got Pilate's predecessor removed. Pilate knew that. He didn't want that to happen to him. So he's like, whatever, I'll pacify him. I'll kill this guy. Not, no big deal. That's the way they do. Play political games, win political prizes. So Herod had to watch his P's and Q's and... He needed the Jews to like him. He's not really a true Jew. Herod went into action and took a Hasmonean wife, who were, the Hasmoneans were friends of the Jews, remember, named Mariamne, who was a princess, and he married her in 37 B.C. This gains him favor with the Jews. Per Bruce Gore, at this point, he does away with his first wife, Doris, and the son, Antipater. So he banishes them, gets rid of them. This is a good point to talk about Rome controlling the priesthood, which we've already done, no longer Levitically pure like it was in the old days, the Jewish society had become corrupted and integrated with Rome. In Acts 23, Paul speaks roughly to a man not realizing he's the high priest. Now let me ask a question. If anybody should have known who the high priest was, if anybody knew Judaism, who was it in the New Testament? Paul. Well, why? let's just turn there. Go to Acts 23. Let's look at that for a second. Acts 23. Acts 23, verse 1. We read this. Then Paul, looking earnestly at the council, now remember, he's on trial, and he's in front of the Sanhedrin, said, Men and good brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day, 
And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. <laughs> for, for you sit to judge me according to the law and do not command... Do you command me to be struck contrary to the law? He'd done nothing wrong. And those who stood by said, Do you revile God's high priest? Then Paul said, I did not know, brethren, that he was the high priest. For it is written, You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. So Paul didn't know. Well, how did Paul not know? Because this guy shouldn't have been the acting high priest, but he's been appointed by those on the outside. So there's part of your issues. And I, I think part of understanding the New Testament for me and you, we have to understand the backdrop and the story just a little bit to know everything that's going on. And I think for so long, many people have read the New Testament and not understood any of the history that's overlaid or the lead up that gets to it. And if we'll understand who these characters are, then it'll just help us when we read the story about everything that's going on. Is it not helpful to know, why didn't the Jews like Herod? Oh, he wasn't a true Jew. He was appointed by Rome. Like, is that not important to what we're doing? Well, that makes sense with it. Yeah, I mean, there's all kind of things like that that are in the Bible that... We need to understand the original readers would have understood it. They lived in it. There's audience relevance that's everywhere in the story. Okay, let's go back to the notes. In Acts 23, Paul speaks roughly to a man not realizing he was the high priest because he wasn't rightfully the high priest. All of that to say that Herod appointed his brother-in-law in 36 B.C. To, the priest, to, to be the high priest whose name was Aristobulus III. The Jews liked the Hasmoneans, so they didn't have an issue with Herod appointing Aristobulus. Remember, the, the Jews and the Hasmoneans had been in cahoots ever since the days of the Maccabees, roughly 100 years earlier. <coughs> Is everybody good so far? I know it's boring, but at least are we learning something? Has anybody learned something that they didn't know yet? Okay, good. All right. It was common for rulers back in these days to kill anyone who became a threat. Nero would later kill his own wife and his mother. Aristobulus became a threat, uh, Herod suspected, and mysteriously wound up dead in just a few feet of water in roughly 35 B.C. So it, that's kind of the way they worked back then. It, you, I mean, the Clintons do it today and they get away with it. But, uh, I mean, just sorry, I'm just saying. But, uh, I mean, same thing. Some things never change. That'll be on video forever on my YouTube page, too. So I'm sure somebody will leave something in the comments. All right. Um, around the year 32 B.C., Herod has to fight a local battle against uh, Nabadia while Rome is in a civil war of Mark Antony versus Octavian. Remember, Mark Antony and Caesar Augustus, whose name was Octavian, they had, they had defeated Brute after he killed Julius Caesar, but now they were going to war against each other. Well, whose side naturally do you think that Herod the Great was going to side with? Well, Mark Antony, because Mark Antony is the one that helped him get appointed king of the Jews. The problem is, guess who's fixing to win this war? Octavian, Caesar Augustus, not Mark Antony. Well, what kind of situation does that put Herod in? Not a good one, because he sided with the losing side. So, naturally, should Herod be replaced at this point? Would you expect that he's going to get replaced? Yeah, exactly. So... Um, look with me in the middle where it says, So Octavian doesn't necessarily like Herod, and Herod chose sides against him in his battle with Mark Antony, leading to assumptions that Herod would be fired. So Herod goes to Rome, kisses up to Octavian. He must have been a really good salesman. He might have been a better car salesman than Trenton is, and Trenton sold like 50 cars this week, so I don't know. But he goes to Rome, he kisses up to Octavian, and receives another opportunity to rule over Judea again in 30 B.C. So he's a career politician. Uh, that's been a thing for a long time, too. Shortly after, Herod has Miriamne executed for supposed infidelity. Josephus records this and states, the 25-year-old Miriam, uh, Miriamne died with dignity. Over the next few years, Herod kills yet again when perceived uh, threats come against his power. One example was a brother of Miriamne whose name was Costabar, Herod had him killed. So he kind of becomes paranoid in these days leading up to the time of Christ. He then takes on a few building projects. And I'll be honest, I learned some things in this section of this this week while I was studying this. One is the rebuilding of Samaria, which now would be called Sebaste. In the year 23, he builds his own palace called the Herodium. It was extravagant, wealthy, huge, um, probably about 20 miles from Jerusalem. 
It was made of large stones. And Josephus says it was essentially a man-made mountain that he built. Everybody would marvel when they looked at it. In 22 B.C., he also built Caesarea Maritima. You ever read the New Testament and wonder, why are all these places called Caesarea? Caesarea Philippi, why are they doing that? Yeah, they're just sucking up to Caesar. That's all they're doing. Well, we're going to rename it after Caesar, so he'll like us. Maybe he'll appoint us and move us up. In 20 B.C., this is the most important building project. In 20 B.C., he began to construct the Jewish temple. Let me clarify. He would expand and beautify it. This was the second temple built in Jerusalem. He was now making upgrades to it. Solomon's temple was destroyed in roughly 586 B.C. by Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. Then return from the exile allowed folks such as Ezra and Nehemiah to rebuild Jerusalem. Now, in the year 20 B.C., Herod would put his touches on the temple that we see in the New Testament, which is why it's often called Herod's Temple. And I'll be honest, I didn't know that. I hear it called Herod's Temple all the time, and I'm like, well, Herod didn't build that temple. What he did was upgrade it, and he upgraded it with these massive stones just like he built out of his palace. Continuing on, these stones were so large it would have been unimaginable for it to be destroyed. And I think this is why in the Olivet Discourse, when Jesus predicts its destruction, the disciples were so shocked. Remember he said, not one stone will be left upon another? Well, that's because Herod had just did this massive upgrade to this building project, and they're saying, what? When's this going to be? What's going to be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? In the year 10 B.C. is when this was dedicated. Do you think the Jews liked it? Absolutely. They loved it. So Herod's gaining favor, and that's why you still see the Herod dynasty, even after Herod the Great dies. In 8 B.C., he accuses his two sons, Alexander and Aristobulus, of high treason. They were later executed. In 4 B.C., he executes another son named Antipater for treason as well. If he thought you were coming against him, he'd just say, Ah, you're committing treason, you're trying to get me removed, and he'd just wax them. They, all those kings and rulers did that stuff all the time. Where am I at? I, oh, I'm at dude was paranoid. Sorry. Uh, some suggest Herod died in 4 B.C. Personally, I believe it could have been 2 B.C., but that's speculation. Now, here's why I say that. Let me show of hands here. How many of you think that Jesus died in 33 A.D.? By show of hands. How many of you think Jesus died in 30 A.D.? By show of hands. Which is it? I don't know. Uh, it's speculative. <laughs> but here's why it matters. We know that Herod was still alive when Jesus was a baby in Matthew 2. Remember? Jesus, at least, I think speculatively, was probably two years old when they go and return back. So they're going to go return. But then they hear Archelaus was ruling in Judea, so they went by and went to Nazareth, I think it was. So if Herod dies in 4 B.C., then that means Jesus would have been born in 6. Well, the year 0 doesn't count, so 6 down 1, that's 5. Jesus would have died in roughly 27. I don't think that adds up. If Herod dies in 2, that means that Jesus would have been born in 4. Everybody stay with me for a second. If Herod dies in 2, Jesus would have been born in 4. Well, there's 3 years plus 30. That gets you to the year 30 A.D. and lets Jesus be 33 and a half years old when he dies. That's my speculation. I don't know if that's right or not. If Jesus was born in the year zero, and that's what they're doing with the calendar, whatever, I don't care, it doesn't change anything at all to me. If he died in 33, or if he died in 30. But a lot of people use Herod's death to help with that dating. That makes sense to anybody, or was that way too much? Okay. All right, let's finish this up. Herod had ten wives and children by five of them. The kids are who we need to care about, um, and they are... Herod Archelaus, Matthew 2, remember, where did Jesus and them flee in Matthew 2 when Jesus was a baby? Joseph took them down to where? Egypt. And then they heard Herod died and they came back. Well, his son, Herod Archelaus, was the one that was in rule. He was so bad, he was exiled by Rome in 6 AD. His rule didn't last very long. Another son was Herod Antipas in Matthew chapter 14. Antipas is the one that kills John the Baptist and is the one who Jesus appears before on trial in Luke 23. Remember when Pilate said, I find no fault in the man, he sent him to Herod. Well, he didn't send him to Herod the Great. He sent him to his son, Herod Antipas, who wanted him to dance and put on a clown show, and then he sent him back over to Pontius Pilate. 
So this is a dynasty that's running all the way through. And what you see is Herod the Great, Herod's sons, Herod's grandsons, and all the way down to Herod's great-grandsons in the New Testament. That's a, and it's very possible that in Daniel chapter 7, when it talks about the little horn, a lot of people think the little horn is the dynasty of the Herods that caused all this issue with the Christians all the way through. All right, remember in Matthew 14, John the Baptist gets beheaded. Here's why. Who was it that, was, that did this? Uh, Herod Antipas had taken another son of Herod, Philip II, had taken his wife. And John the Baptist was like, uh, you can't do that. And they said, no, we're not listening to John the Baptist. So for the birthday, they cut John's head off and brought it on a platter. Yeah, the girl asked for it. No, right. Yep. Nobody's going to talk about my mama like that. So, okay, let's keep going. Finally, Herod Philip II. Now, why Herod would name one son Philip I and the next one Philip II, I have no idea, um, but he did. Finally, Herod Philip II, whose wife was stolen by Antipas in the wild Matthew 14 story, <laughs> Agrippa II is who Paul appears before on trial in Acts 26, which was the great-grandson of Herod the Great. Agrippa I is also mentioned as he was eaten by worms in Acts chapter 12 and verse 23. Yeah, so this whole, these cats were bad news, okay? So all the way from the beginning, they were always against them, and it's no different than Esau coming against Jacob in the Old Testament. So you show up in Matthew 2, and you've got Jesus is born king of the Jews, and Herod's like, nah, that ain't flying. I'm the king of the Jews. The Roman Senate said so in 39 B.C. Well, we see who won out, so. All right, does that help? (laughs) Uh, that should cover a lot of things that you want to know about Herod the Great for the rest of your life. So we will never have to do that again. And some of you are thinking, never come back to this Sunday school class. <laughs> but, all right, any questions? No. No. Th- they were all, yeah, especially the boys. They were all so set up against each other. The whole thing, it was just, it must have been a kibosh of chaos. The Pharisees don't like the Romans. The Romans don't care about the Jews. And you think about these Roman rulers who were appointed over the Judeans. They don't care about those people. They just need them in order to retain their power. What they were thinking, Judea is kind of backwaters, backwoods. If they're over there, they're not very powerful in Rome. All they're doing is trying to move up the ladder. But if all these people keep calling to Rome and saying, man, these guys are jerks, they can't even keep the peace over there in the backwoods places, they're not going to give them anything prominent in Rome and appoint them to the Senate later in their life. Very similar. Keep the peace no matter the cost. I think a lot of people assume it. I think a lot of people assume it because it says he was king of the Jews. And they don't understand that, no, Rome's the one that appointed him king of the Jews. They probably just assume, all right, well, you read the lineage of Matthew chapter 1, and Jesus is there. We've done this a thousand times, but for anybody that's new in here, let me do this again. Go back to Matthew chapter 1 right quick, and we'll, I'll close. My contingency is, say they had never gone into sin and they had never been exiled, and they would have kept having kings sit on the throne who would have come from Judah, well, it would have gone this way. And I think this is why Matthew includes this after the exile in Matthew chapter 1 to Babylon. Look at verse 12. After they were brought to Babylon, Jeconiah begot Shiltiel, Shiltiel begot Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel begot Abihu. Now remember Jeremiah's letter? Jeremiah 29, Jeremiah wrote a letter to Daniel and Ezekiel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they were in exile. And he said, hey, while you're there, have babies, raise up the commonwealth. Some of them are going to come back. Why? To get the Messiah born. And this is what Matthew's showing us. 13, Zerubbabel begot Abayud, Abayud begot Eliakim, Eliakim begot Azor. I hear you. Azor begot Zadok, Zadok begot Ockham, Ockham begot Eliud, Eliud begot Eleazar, Eleazar begot Matin, Matin begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary. So, if they would have never gone into exile, it's my persuasion, who would have been the king whenever Jesus was born? Joseph would have been the rightful king. 
Therefore, his oldest firstborn son would have been the next rightful heir. Oh, by the way, what tribe does he come from? Judah, the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes. That's why Matthew 2 says, This is he who was born king of the Jews. They knew the lineage. They still had it. They wrote it down. See the connection? That's why I think that. But I'll be honest, I've not heard anybody else say that. So take it, study it, and do with it what you want. Okay. Is that good?